Good afternoon. Thanks, Doug. We're going to see if I can drive this Mac because I'm Mac illiterate. And Richard, if it weren't for the Packers, I'd be moving to Minnesota because <laughs> it's pretty dreamy there in terms of what's happening with buildings and energy. So I have two questions for you. Here's your group participation. You won't have to touch any of your neighbors or anything because I know we're all Midwesterners. Um, how many of you have identified something in your, um, some, some type of energy savings approach in your home that will require some kind of remodeling or big equipment change out? And how many of you have that appointment booked with the remodeler or the equipment guy? Okay, just, just keep that in your mind. There's a couple hands in the back, I know. We are in an energy summit, okay. Um, and then I just wanted to get, so think about that for a second, and then I, I wanted to get a sense of who's here. How many of you are in the hard sciences? Work in the hard sciences. I know all the guys in the hard sciences are like, okay, what exactly does she mean by that? Um, how about engineers? Yes, excellent economists, policy wonks, marketing and communications specialists, Oh, a couple. Um, social media gurus. Artists. Yay, there's an artist here. That's great. How about um, designers? Community organizers. You do everything. You're awesome. Okay, so just keep that in mind because um, I'm, okay, this, let's try this. Because we ha you guys are developing the technical solutions to make buildings perform better. And we homo sapiens that live, work, play, worship, and learn in these buildings are not always on board, right? Just like you're not getting remodeling done tomorrow morning at your house. You put a human in a building and all those great aspirations around um, low energy use can go out the window. And so if we think about who we should be partnering with, um, maybe it's the people that taught us, the brand experts that taught us we need a $4 cup of coffee multiple times a day, so much so that we'll actually have it as a key point of conversation. Or maybe it's the design mentality that made the iPhone solve all of our problems and that we can't live without it now. I just was downstairs watching 150 students standing in line for pizza and no one was talking to each other. They were, all had exactly the same posture. It, was, it would have made a great picture. Or maybe you're somebody who can really tap into people's anger and frustration and the wild emotional side of them and turn that into a, a political situation. Or maybe we need to think about the visceral experience that Californians are having right now living in a drought and how every time you run into a Californian and you say it's raining here, they say, wow, I wonder what that's like, right? Or maybe you could motivate people on a spiritual plane or just even as a role model by doing good first. And I think all of those skills, those are the kind of things that make people take action. They're not always rational. In fact, they're often irrational because humans are really irrational. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the things that are going on in the green building movement and if we can keep that in mind about how, to, how framing, messaging, behavior, all those things make a difference. I think it um, makes us more amenable to reducing our energy load in buildings and our energy use in buildings because really it's about also getting the people on board. So that's my frame for the day. So first I'll talk a little bit about energy codes. Um, this is a map of the U.S. These are commercial energy codes that are seen here. And one of the cool things about the codes movement is that it really is a movement. It's well-funded. It includes a lot of collaboration and cooperation between the professional societies that ensure the advancement of energy engineering practice um, and the policy and advocacy organizations that care about low energy use. And they, they work really well together um, to make sure that there is a strong international energy code that keeps driving energy use down um, and pushing that in different states. So if you look at this map, the blue states are the ones that have the, have the most current version of the international energy code. Um, you'll see that all of our football, major football rivals except Michigan um, are blue. Yellow, sadly, is um, 
the 2009 version of the code, not the 2012 version of the code. Wisconsin in the early 2000s used to not even get money to work on codes because we were so advanced, but we've lost some of that leadership over time. The, there's a couple spots of green in the Northeast. Those are uh, places that are working on stretch codes or green codes that push past the international standard. And then we have those sad gray places that don't even have an energy code or, or are significantly below the mark. So the good news is this is gonna keep advancing and t this is the floor, right? If you build a building that uses more energy than the code, you're building a building that's against the law. The bad news is that homo sapien part, um, so I'll take Illinois for example. Um, in Illinois, they have the 2012 energy code, nice and aggressive, and this state capitol passed an ordinance saying, hey, here in Springfield, we're not gonna follow that code because it's really expensive to enforce it, so we're just not gonna do that. And in fact, if you look more closely, for instance, at Illinois, you see whole jurisdictions that have no code enforcement officials. Nobody's employed to check on this thing. And so if you look at this map, it will look more like Swiss cheese or lace with holes all over the place where human beings have kind of gotten in the way of the policy and mucked it all up. Um, and so that's one of the challenges. One of the um, actions that's being taken is all of those utility incentive programs that incentivize energy efficient behavior and technologies. In some places, there are efforts to have utilities help fund some of the gaps in enforcement and compliance. So that's, that's the state of the floor in terms of energy codes. Um, and then I'll talk about the big aspiration and the um, activities that have been going on at the U.S. Green Building Council. So for those of you who aren't familiar with USGBC, our vision is green buildings for everyone within this generation. We're, we don't shy away from big, hairy goals at USGBC, and we have a huge marketing engine there. Um, and so this is the kind of messaging and framing that you see coming out of USGBC. And indeed, it really is meant to be um, and the most practical on-road to green buildings, green buildings for the masses. And so you're probably familiar with the LEED, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design rating system. You can see these plaques. Um, I don't know if this building is a LEED building, but the, um, the energy, the, the WID building is LEED, the Energy Institute is LEED Gold, and our building, as Doug said, is LEED Platinum. You can come visit us. If you really want an amazing LEED experience, go to the Lake Mills Elementary School. Um, they just certified LEED Platinum in its most current version, which includes a lot of environmental product declarations, and it's full of art and daylight and fresh air, and it really, it's an astonishing tribute to the green building movement full of also really cute little kids recycling and composting. Um, the LEED uh, standard and certification, there are different versions by building type, so there's a LEED for homes, a LEED for healthcare, there's also different versions for new and existing buildings. And um, we have achieved some scale. So here's, here's the good news. Um, this is, these are March numbers, um, almost 4 billion square feet. I'm sure we've surpassed that by now globally. Um, over 27,000 commercial LEED certified projects and over 181,000 LEED residential projects. Most of these are affordable housing, so we're proud of that. And certifying over 2 million square feet daily globally, 40% of that square footage is outside the United States. So really growing globally. And we have a, a, a pretty big army of LEED accredited professionals out there. But when you hold it up against Doug's number of 5 million commercial buildings and 180 million residential buildings, you can see we have a long way to go. And LEED, LEED has probably got the biggest numbers, would you say, the big scale? Okay, so you can see we have still plenty of work to do out there as a movement in green buildings. I think one of, um, in 150 countries and territories, one of the reasons that LEED has been effective and the USGBC has been effect effective is that it's driven first by a big marketing and framing engine that helps uh, homo sapiens and people get on board. Um, so it started first with architects and engineers and captured the designers' imaginations 
about what the potential in buildings could be. And then our frame is around making buildings safe, healthy, inclusive, smart, productive, efficient, equitable, sustainable, responsive, and resilient. And there's something for everybody, what their, whatever their motivations are in there. So if low energy use is not the primary motivator for your building owner or your building occupant, maybe a healthy building is that, that resonates with more people. Um, and then there's been a long process, I'm going to kind of speak a heresy outside the USGBC tradition, but more of a seventh wave belief is that this promise is something that the technical side of LEED has always worked through all of its various versions to catch up with, and that's kind of been the process. So um, the LEED standard is always under review and revision and developing and catching up with this marketing message. One of the most exciting things I think that's happening at USGBC is we're starting to look at other kinds of ways to address sustainability. Um, so the first picture that you see up in the left-hand corner, that's the lead dynamic plaque, and it's giving that occupant uh, real-time performance data around water, waste, energy use, transportation, and the human experience, which often includes indoor air quality, which is really linked to energy use. Um, and then you can see that that would work well on your iPhone. It, it's like a Fitbit for a building. That's the aspiration. We don't have all the technical kinks completely worked out yet. Um, but that's one of the opportunities we want to create to make the building more visceral of an experience. Um, people can actually see if their building is slipping on its energy performance. The next big exciting thing that we're rolling out is the well building standard. And I will, in addition to being compatible and interwoven with LEED, that will address air, water, nourishment, light, fitness, comfort, my, and mind. And it aligns, aligns with LEED, so it aligns with the energy standards, so that people who are motivated more by having a healthy building or a healthy human environment can go for the well building standard. And we think because of all the healthcare construction, that's going to really take off as well. Um, sustainable sites is about actually looking at things like what Richard was talking about and what's the transportation cost and um, what's the difference between a green field and a brown field and what's really the best way to get sus a sustainable site when you're making a decision about um, a building or a whole community. And the, um, the EDGE standard is a new one that we've just acquired which looks at what happens when you don't have the market in place or the infrastructure in place in a developing country to make sustainability happen at the sophistication of LEED or uh, American Green Building Standard. And that looks at things like safety and clean water and clean air. Um, but the one I'm the most excited about is uh, the GRESB um, Global Real Estate Sustainability Benchmark, and that's looking at grading portfolios of buildings at the investment level based on their sustainability. Energy is a huge piece of that because of the cost of energy, um, and showing uh, investment level um, portfolio deciders what's, what makes the most sense for, um, for the payback, the return on investment, showing that sustainable buildings are a better investment. And since you guys like data, I know you do, I want to show you kind of some of the, this is a publicly accessible database called gbig.org, and I'll show you that website in a second, but you can go into a region of the, uh, anywhere in the world, and it takes, it has uh, an inventory of green buildings, so here's Brazil, and you can zoom in on Sao Paulo, and you can zoom in at the street level, and you can do this for places all over the world. Um, and it's part of our effort at USGBC to make this data more publicly accessible so you can go figure out what you want to do with it. Um, it doesn't just include lead data, it also includes all the DOE's data and other, um, all of the new rating systems will feed into that. So I'm hoping that we'll see scientists and engineers attacking that and using it for research. That's lead and USGBC, that's the big guy. <clears throat> I don't know if it's the sexiest guy though. I actually think um, and I'm not the expert on this, Richard is, because he used to work there, but the living building challenge is probably the most aspirational and the coolest, sexiest, um, really, what could a building be? How, instead of making a building less bad, could we make it regenerative? Could a building actually 
contribute to sustaining life. So there are 20 imperatives as part of, the, part of the Living Building Challenge, and they include things like net positive energy, water, and waste, a healthy indoor environment, a biophilic environment, um, addressing the embodied carbon in the manufacturing processes of the building materials, justice, and a building's ability to inspire and educate, among others. And I really encourage you to take a look at this. It's very aspirational. Um, there are living buildings out there. They're not at the same scale, but they really demonstrate what we could do if we really wanted to with the built environment. And I'll share just a little bit about what Seventh Wave is just launched last month. It's a program called Accelerate Performance. We were funded by the DOE. Um, to kind of attack the new construction market, we've talked a little bit about codes. And so if you look at the business as usual trajectory here, if we keep on using energy and buildings the way we are now, we're in trouble. And so we want to keep ramping that down, right? So the 2030 goal is the line that you see on the bottom. And then at the top, you see codes and policies and the gap between codes and policies. And we'll keep trying to smush up and close that gap between the aspiration of the code and the compliance. But there's still a whole big hunk of buildings that, don't, that aren't touched by those things. Um, so LEED and the Living Building Challenge are out there. We know that we've got technology innovation to help fill the gap and other voluntary efforts, utility programs. Um, but at Seventh Wave, we've really been looking at the gap that's out there that we see is the owner is not involved in setting these energy targets. And so our on the ground experiences showed us that we have to get those owners involved and that that can be a key to having a more powerful player at the table. And so we're transforming the procurement paradigm with Accelerate Performance. The building owner under this program will be allowed to set an EUI target and hold the design team contractually responsible through their compensation for whether the building actually performs to that target. For those of you who are mechanical engineers in the room who work on buildings, you know that right now the way we set goals usually is the way, um, is through modeling and it's um, a plan for how the building should perform but we don't really hold anybody accountable for how the building actually does perform in energy use. This will allow an owner to retain part of the compensation until that building actually demonstrates that even with people in it, it performs the way it's supposed to. And we want to do that at um, little or no additional cost. So uh, it's brand new. Um, it's been piloted in a couple of government buildings, and also we piloted at Seventh Wave on the University of Chicago campus, um, making a long-term plan for the campus. and uh, they. They think they're in terms of 100-year buildings, the way a lot of university owners do. And what they found was their retrofitted buildings were outperforming their new buildings in terms of energy use. And they said, this is not good. We're, we have a big capital improvement plan. We have to get this energy use down. And so we ha helped them hold a design competition. So this is for a dormitory building. And these four buildings with a set budget and a set energy use index these were the four pictures of dorms that we got. And they were, they were, it allowed the design teams to bring forward the strategies that they felt the most comfortable with. It wasn't prescriptive about how they got there. And it, you can really see how it encouraged innovation. Um, but there was not going to be extra payment for extra energy performance. Everybody had to meet the same EUI target. Um, and now, I, the, one, the one in the bottom right hand corner is under construction in Chicago. And they um, were talking to the university about adopting that for all of their buildings going forward, and that's the core strategy for Accelerate Performance. I'll talk just briefly about homes. You see this, right? How many of you have a Nest Learning thermostat in your house, or as we call it at my house, the Eye of Sauron? We, we have some issues with, um, we have an unusual energy <clears throat> system in our house in the nest, and we don't get along that well. Um, but most people really like it. Um, and you can set your temperature from home, and the ability to say, hey, I'm coming home, I want my house to be warmer or cooler, that's very attractive to people, that sense of control, the homo sapien in charge of the world, they have it on their phone. Um, but the evil genius behind Nest, which is now owned by the Google, um, this is their public-facing 
your smart home shouldn't be dumb way of appealing to consumers, not around energy use. It's not about, you know, your, the cost of your energy. This is about your smart, right? It's a different psychological pull on people. But as you read through the text, the thing that's really cool and really scary about Nest is that um, it's a platform, just like the iPhone is a platform. And so many, many other kinds of technologies in your home, security, um, indoor air quality sensors, uh, lighting, smoke detectors, they all can come in with Nest on a works with Nest platform. That's the kind of thinking we have to get to in terms of energy use so that we're solving more problems than just lowering the carbon footprint or the energy use of a building. This is gonna be very smart, and all of these folks that are on Nest can now, um, Nest can work out arrangements with utilities to, to do automatic shutoffs at peak times. It's, that's the future, that's the kind of the interconnected grid issue that we're gonna see. So I hope I've inspired you to think a little bit about the homo sapiens that are in our buildings, not just the energy use, because without the cooperation of all these people, um, we can't get to the lower energy use that we need. So um, thank you very much. And I think Lauren's gonna talk about existing buildings. I talked a lot about new buildings, but you're gonna talk about existing buildings. So thank you. Thank you.